Welcome to the Café Culture podcast, a season of discussions on culture, politics, philosophy and science. At a talk recorded on the 6th of October 2014, Derek Bell discussed social and environmental justice in Newcastle. Thanks, Joe. Okay, so, so I am a political philosopher. Um, and political philosophy is a discipline that has historically been concerned with questions of justice. But the political philosophy approach to justice has tended to have two features, certainly in the last 50 years or so. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> certainly in the last 50 years or so. So firstly, it's been concerned with ideal and abstract principles of justice. So the kind of thing that, that Joel actually likes, right? Yes. So the work of the great thinkers of the last 50 years, John Rawls, Ronald Dworkin, Robert Nozick, they've been imagining ideal societies, very abstract principles of justice. But increasingly, political philosophers, they're more concerned, they're increasingly concerned with the non-ideal theory, with non-ideal circumstances, with the real world, with the idea of how we apply principles of justice. So all of these things in academic disciplines are often cyclical, especially in a discipline like philosophy or politics, where you find that you get this movement from the abstract, the ideal, through the non-ideal. Presumably, we'll have another ideal turn at some point in the next 30 or 40 years. But that, that tension between the ideal and the non-ideal is, is fascinating. It is something that's really challenging for political philosophers. Now, the second feature that I think that's particularly important about the philosophy, political philosophy approach to justice over the last few years is that thinking about justice in contemporary political philosophy has been either at the scale of the nation state so we're thinking about justice to our fellow citizens. Or we're thinking about the principles that should guide, principles of justice that should guide the institutions at nation state level. Or we're thinking about justice at the scale of the globe. So we get cosmopolitan theories of justice. Political philosophers with very, very few exceptions have said little or nothing about justice at the scale of the city or the sub-national region. So I'm actually interested in thinking about justice and injustice at the scale of the city. I'm interested in both ideal abstract principles and in non-ideal application at the city scale. Now this is a new project for me, so this is still early thinking. This is work in progress. So. Uh, Joel suggested that if you had questions at the end of my talk about things that hadn't been answered, well, actually, nothing much will be answered. Um, I have more questions than answers at the moment, but then that probably isn't unusual for a philosopher. So what I'm going to do is start actually with two questions. Suggest some provisional thinking about potential answers to those questions, and then end up actually with some further questions that I hope will stimulate some, some debate, <laughs> some discussion. So the two starting questions are these. So firstly, should we actually think about justice at the city scale? Are there good reasons at all for doing that? And then secondly, if we do think we should think about justice at the city scale, then how should we do that? What would a conception of justice at the city scale look like? What would that be? So the first question, should we think about justice at the city scale at all? Well, political philosophers, as I've said, have shown really no interest in that. But others have shown some interest in it. So policy makers have shown some interest in it. Geographers have shown some interest in it. And planners in particular, actually, academic planners have shown some interest in it. I think notable, notably, there was a brief period, started about five years ago, 
in the UK where we saw a number of UK cities set up fairness commissions to look at how to promote fairness within their cities. I take it that fairness is effectively acting as a synonym here for social justice. We can discuss that later if you want. And they were interested in promoting fairness at the city scale. Now one of those cities that set up a fairness commission was Newcastle. And Newcastle did that particularly in the context of thinking about how to make cuts fairly when it was having to make cuts after the coalition government came in. And it set up this fairness commission about which I'll say a little bit more later on. But it seems at least that policy makers, practitioners, think there is a justice or a fairness issue at the city scale. So on at least one view of the role of the political philosopher that sees the political philosopher as a social critic, if you like, then political philosophers probably should pay some attention to this issue, this question of justice at the city scale. If policymakers are thinking about it, then we should think about the way they're thinking about it. The second reason, perhaps, for thinking about justice at the city scale is to look at the inequalities that we actually find in Newcastle. Perhaps also at inequalities between Newcastle and elsewhere. But I'm going to focus on the inequalities in Newcastle, within the city. So if we look, for example, at the most comprehensive study of deprivation in England, the English Indices of Deprivation, which was last compiled a few years ago, admittedly in 2010, it divides the country into small geographical areas, what it calls lower super output areas, or LSOAs. And each of those LSOAs has a population of between 1,000 and 3,000 people. In 2010, Newcastle had 173 LSOAs. That's how it was divided up. And 43 of those 173, so almost 25% of them, were actually in the 10% most deprived LSOAs in England. So 25% of the LSOAs in Newcastle were in the 10% most deprived in England. But 11 LSOAs, so 6% of the Newcastle LSOAs, were in the 10% least deprived in England. Now that seems to suggest some quite radical inequalities between areas and between people in Newcastle. We see similar contrasts if we look at more recent data on, for example, employment and wages. So about 10% of the population in Newcastle are classified as unemployed. But of those that are employed, the lowest paid 25% earn less than £12,000 per annum per year. But the highest paid 10% are earning over £40,000 per year. Again, quite a radical difference there. Or again, if we look at something as basic as how long people live, life expectancy is 13.7 years lower for men in the most deprived areas of the city than it is in the least deprived areas of the city. 13.7 years lower. So we might think that these inequalities make a, an initial case, a prima facie case, for thinking about injustice at the city scale. It seems at least to be a question to be asked. Are the inequalities that we find in our city, and of course in many other cities, are those inequalities unjust? So provisionally, there seems to be a call here for a theory of justice in the city. What would a theory of justice in the city look like? So that's the second question. How should we conceive of justice in the city? Now we might go at this by starting with, as political philosophers tend to do, some kind of abstract theory of justice, right? Um, and that's very tempting. I could do that. I'm happy to talk about what that might look like later. It could look like all kinds of different things, right? An obvious way to do it would be to start with a theory of justice that's been applied at the national scale, nation-state scale, or at the global scale, and then try to 
press it down to the spatial scale of the city and think about what that does. But I want to start kind of the other way around. So I want to start actually with one of the few things that has actually looked at how we should think about justice or fairness in Newcastle. So I want to start with that Newcastle Fairness Commission report. And that was published in 2012. It was a piece of work that was done, was commissioned by the City Council, as I said before, to think about um, how to deal fairly with austerity, essentially. The title of that report was Fair Share, Fair Play, Fair Go, Fair Say. They got a nice rhyme in there. Okay. Fair share, fair play, fair go, fair say. You want me closer? Sorry. Okay. Um, so let's run through what those four things are. Fair share, fair play, fair go, fair say. And then I'll say something about, something a little bit more critical about them. Okay. So fair share. Essentially, they interpret that as fair outcome. And their, their gloss on that, if you like, is those who need more should get more. So it's needs-based. But their definition of need is quite interesting, really. They say what somebody needs is what somebody would require to lead a minimally decent human life in 21st century Britain. Now, I'm sure we'll return to that phrasing a bit later. So let's repeat it what you would require to lead a minimally decent human life in 21st century Britain. Fair play, the second of their concepts, they describe as fair process. And again, they gloss that as even-handedness in decision-making about the allocation of resources. So using the right criteria, and they give this Perhaps slightly odd example, um, or at least one that doesn't necessarily help us think about the kind of issues they act actually deal with. So they say that in a train car in a train crash, medics should prioritise those with the greatest medical needs, not those in the first class carriage. Well, yeah. Um, so they put it again. They put it another way: privilege shouldn't buy priority. Okay. So that's their notion of fair process. Third thing, they say, is this idea of fair goal. And by that, they mean fair opportunity. And they emphasize that fair opportunity should be genuinely accessible opportunity, not just merely formal equality of opportunity, but genuinely accessible. And then their fourth principle is fair say, fair participation. And their phrasing of that is, everyone who has a voice should be heard. Right? They also, in addition, talk about the idea and the importance of fairness to future generations, and they talk about the importance of civic responsibility. They say everybody has a responsibility to contribute to civil society um, in a manner commensurate with their ability and resources. So to directly quote, they say, we should all help to build a better society, and we should all contribute to facing hardship. Obviously, any report like this, it's easy to criticize. And to some extent, that's what I'm going to do, right? Partly because it's easy. To be fair, I think the Fairness Commission in Newcastle, actually, in comparison with some Fairness Commissions, probably did a good job. Um, I think they did, the right, in some respects, the right kind of thing. But the difficulty is that you got an attempt to balance this problem of theorizing about justice with trying to get something that has real application. And that's tricky, right? Now, it is, I think, in the main, what they're offering is a liberal democratic conception of social justice. So we see it's democratic credentials really in the notion of a fair say 
But there's no real challenge there to the existing institutions of local democracy. There's just really a suggestion that those who are democratically elected should ensure that they consult widely and that they listen to what people say. There's no really radical notion of democracy there. No move towards participatory democracy or anything like that. The fair go principle, I take it, is a version of the liberal principle of fair equality of opportunity. Now that requires more than a competitive job market with anti-discrimination and anti-nepotism laws. And in one of the examples that they talk about, they talk about the implications of that, the principles that, that they're looking at. And they talk particularly about education and they think about the implications of this principle of fair opportunity for education. And they endorse the idea that this might give you reason to invest more in children in disadvant socially disadvantaged communities. Well, that's kind of, you know, I'm not going to disagree with that. That sounds like a good policy. But what they're not questioning is the idea that there are socially disadvantaged communities, right? And that that status quo is something that we should be seeking to challenge. So they don't really pay any attention to injustices kind of spatially organized. And they don't pay any ten attention really to the role of space in sustaining and reproducing injustice. Now the fair share principle that, I think, again, is a liberal principle, but it's a fairly minimal liberal principle of distribution. It requires a social minimum rather than any notion of equality. It's formulated in terms of the ability, really, to lead a minimally decent life in 21st century Britain. So it actually requires more than everyone having the same minimum income Instead, everyone should have the same minimal set of capabilities. So unlike a lot of liberal theories, the work of people like Rawls or Dworkin, that have tended to be resourcist, it's more like the work, for those who are familiar, of Amartya Sen or Martha Nussbaum that focuses on the idea of distributing capabilities fairly, the ability to do things. That's what we should care about. But it's still the idea that what we're looking for is that everybody has a minimum set of capabilities, not that we're concerned about the distribution of those capabilities beyond the minimum. We're not concerned about whether, as long as everybody's above the minimum floor, then some people can be able to do all kinds of things, whereas other people can just be able to do the minimum. Right. It's not challenging that at all. The fair play principle, I take it, seems to call for impartiality in decision making. So a kind of equality before the law, non-discrimination, keeping money or privilege out of the decision making process. Again, unobjectionable, but not obviously tremendously demanding. Now it's interesting that that conception of social justice that they're endorsing there largely liberal, has actually quite a lot in common with the work of one of the key planners who have who've written on, academic planners, who have written on social justice in the city. So there's an American academic, Susan Feinstein, who's a planner at, at Harvard University. And she has written a book on social justice in the city. And she endorses three principles, which she calls democracy, equality, and diversity. Democracy might be a little bit more participatory than what the Fairness Commission is talking about, but probably not a lot. Equality might actually, her conception of equality, might actually be more minimal than what the Fairness Commission is talking about. Because what she talks about is not exacerbating the inequalities that already exist in a city. So city authorities, and city planners in particular, should try to avoid exacerbating inequalities that already exist. So that doesn't mean challenge them. It doesn't mean reduce them. Just don't exacerbate them. And her third idea of diversity is a notion that 
is based on the idea of equal recognition. It's kind of a development of the notion of non-discrimination. Okay? A bit like the fair play principle. Now, those principles are conceptions of social justice proposed by the Fairness Commission and by Susan Feinstein. I think if they were implemented, if they were genuinely implemented in Newcastle or in other cities, they would probably improve where we are now in terms of the way that I, I think many of us would think about social justice. And they might be the appropriate principles given the constraints that city authorities and the people of cities actually face. But they're not very radical. They really do accept much of the status quo. So for those of you who want a more radical theory of social justice in the city, you don't even have to stop being a liberal to want a more radical theory of social justice in the city than that. So an egalitarian liberal, somebody who thought more about participatory democracy, let alone those who adopted a, a, a more questioning view of capitalism or were more concerned about questions of spatial justice. You led to kind of perhaps a bit of a dilemma or a choice at least here. So one way to go is to say, well, we just need a different theory of justice in the city. We just need a more radical conception of what social justice in the city should require. It just needs to be more challenging of the status quo. And we need to work out what the appropriate theory of justice in the city would be. Fairness Commission, Susan Feinstein, you've just got it wrong. That's one way to go. But another way to go is actually to return to the first question about whether we should think about justice in, in the city at all, whether that's the right scale. So you might come to the conclusion that it isn't worth thinking about justice in the city separately from justice in the nation state or justice at the, at the global level. Because if we do think about it at the city level, then we just have to take too much as given, too much as fixed. And we end up with any theory that's even remotely implementable, we end up with a theory that is as limited, shall we say, as the Fairness Commission's conception of social justice or as Feinstein's conception of social justice. Okay, so you can see my, my thinking has kind of gone in a circle. Um, and that's as far as I've got so far. I think there is a really interesting quest set of questions here about justice in the city. But there is a problem. Is this the right scale to think about justice at all? And if it is, then how do we do that? So I'm, I'm keen to hear what other people think about that. And I want to conclude with three questions. So the first question is, do you actually think it is worth thinking about justice at the city scale? Or is that just the wrong scale to be thinking about justice? Second question is, if we do think about justice at the city scale, then do we have to accept much of the status quo? Is, has it got to be a limited conception of justice if it's at the city scale? And the third question, which brings us back to Newcastle and to those inequalities that I presented earlier on, do we think that the inequalities we find in Newcastle actually are injustices? Some of the inequalities that I think we would find in Newcastle would be injustices on the Fairness Commission's account or on Feinstein's account. Some of them wouldn't. So depending upon whether or not we think that people earning less than £12,000 per annum can actually live a minimally decent life in 21st century Britain, that would determine whether or not we thought that people having to live on that was a matter of social injustice or not. I think if we looked at the results of 
different schools across Newcastle in terms of the attainment of their students, we'd find it hard to argue that Newcastle schools lived up to a principle of fair opportunity. So I think there is some critical purchase with those principles. But there are also going to be some things that we think aren't injustices if we accept those principles. So the, the third question then is, are the inequalities we find in Newcastle injustices? And to, take beyond, to go beyond what I've talked about, if they are, then whose responsibility are they? Who should be doing something about them? And that takes us back to the question of the scale. Is this something that city authorities should be dealing with? Should that be a priority for local government? Or is this something that really is a matter for national government or for some other actors? Thank you for listening. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Cafe Culture North East is supported by Newcastle University, Peels and the British Science Association. We're also supported by Ginger's Cafe in Dunn City, who host the events. <laughs>